but Megan. Oh, the mask falls off Megan now. Megan says, Gina, save it. Melthorpe Crown was taken back by the steel in Megan's voice. Megan continued, stop, be quiet. I don't want to hear any negativity. This is a happy time for us. Okay, calm down. Down, girl. Good morning. How are you? Welcome to another episode of Revenge Review. And we're going through Tom Bauer's Revenge as an Answer to Spare. Um, last episode was... I don't know if it was my favorite episode I've ever done, only because it didn't, it, there was no new content. It was all giving us the background to Harry um, so that we could talk about why in the world Megan wanted to become involved with him. Now, obviously his status is what she cared about because if she had met anybody else on the side of the road with the same backstory, she would have been like, no, thank you. That sounds like a basket case, right? Uh, but because Harry had status and privilege, she wanted to get in on it. So. Last time, it was just a lot of what had made Harry, Harry, where was he in life when she decided to prey upon him like a spider? Um, what kind of person was he? What sort of husband material would he be? And I think in this next chapter, the stuff that she comes back to Gina Nelthorpe count about, because Gina's the only one who knows that she's seeing Harry, and I think the only one who realized that she'd been sort of stalking her prey um some of the things she comes back and tells gina harry's putting his best foot forward too in this interaction and you know megan can't say enough lovely wonderful things about him so apparently she hadn't seen the red mist that even he admits to in spare and apparently she didn't know that he had rage issues so you know tom bauer i thought was really fair in his descriptions of all the family members um in the comments people were sort of divided on the subject of what kind of parents harry had had now i do think that you we cannot judge the style of parenting by say today's estimation of parenting first of all today's parenting has enough problems of its own i'm not saying oh well because Charles and Diana weren't doting on him every five seconds and bulldozing everything for him and helicoptering him to death. They failed him, hardly. That kind of parenting has its own problems. But what I'm trying to say, and if I failed to say it last time, what I meant to say was, I, didn't, I don't expect Charles, who comes from the old model of parenting, especially in the monarchy, to have been, you know, changing diapers and helping with homework. I mean, obviously I don't think that, but what I do think is that when he had opportunities to speak directly into his boy's life, specifically about their behavior, he chose not to because he didn't want to be yet one more difficulty in their life, yet one more stumbling block. I think he saw that erroneously, but I think that because he had been dealt with fairly heavily handed by his own father, he, misinterpreted the best way to love his sons was to let them be and just you know fingers crossed they turn out okay you know and i've met so many parents like that who feel like who are reacting to how they were parented and so they have a very hands-off approach to however their kids do things and they're just like they'll come around i did maybe but you could probably negate a lot of the difficulties they'll have in life if you try to lead and guide them even if that means you have to give tough love sometimes. Um, that doesn't mean abusive love. That doesn't mean manipulative love. That doesn't mean that you're trying to crack the whip on your child's back and make it hard for them all the time. All that means is when you see them going down the wrong path, you don't just let them because you don't want to, you know, be a buzzkill, you know? Anyway, the other thing that I want to say about the what I was reading in the comments was, oh my gosh, Okay, so Harry uh, calls the barman an effing frog. And I thought that, I was like, what a dumb childish kind of insult, you know? I mean, I truly could not understand. I was like, is, is, is it like calling somebody a fat pig? I mean, I was like, how childish and lame. That's why I laughed. I didn't know that it was a slur. So now I feel bad that I said it. I truly didn't know. I mean, when you consider the reports on his intellect... And when you consider Sandhurst's reaction to some of the answers they got, which they said were 
some of the most childish answers they'd ever received on the examination, it made sense to me that he would call somebody some kind of lame little name. Okay, so anyway, we just need to get right into today's material. The chapter that we're reading today is called The Catch. I really wanted to combine this chapter because it's short, so that means today's episode won't be as long as usual. But I couldn't combine it with the next chapter because the next chapter is super long. Next chapter might be like an hour and a half. So anyway, I didn't have time to film both things today. So we've just got one, but I, I, it's a good chapter. It's real good. Megan's up just all kinds of nefarious ways as she always is. And, you know, before we went and had that whole, you know, practically a whole episode that was just an aside to tell us all about Harry's background, where we had been up until that point was that Megan has been moving and shaking and networking and she's finally found her way to the prince and she had become friends with um Violet von Westenholtz who worked for Ralph Lauren and uh Megan was going to be wearing Ralph Lauren to Wimbledon and so that was the connection there Violet had grown up with Harry and they'd been childhood friends so when Megan realized this she asked Violet to make an introduction. Violet sent pictures of Megan to Harry and he accepted within a few hours this potential meeting, this blind date. I mean, what was it to him if he went out with this girl? Because, you know, what it's, you know, it's at least something to do. He had been crying and complaining in the last episode that because I'm not a normal man, I, I can't meet people in normal ways. And he uh he was looking forward to this setup um he thought maybe there might be something in it and you know again we also talked last uh episode when we were still on the whole megan thing was that megan had one confidant in this whole thing one person who truly knew it was happening and that was gina nelthorpe town gina was very surprised megan had managed to pull this off and Gina is still of the mind that Megan wants to work. Um, Gina really felt like Megan had connected with her in order to get work in England um, because she wanted to further her career. Gina believed the line that Megan wanted to be a working woman. Um, and that she had, no, you know, Megan's always like, I never wanted to be a lady who lunched. I, I want things to do. So Gina had been working around the clock to find things for Megan to do. But now Megan has found her own way to progress up this ladder. And we're going to see the utter degradation of the relationship that she's built with Gina now that she sees that the end goal is in sight. She got no use for Gina. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Gina is next to nothing in her book now because she didn't need Gina. What is a little L'Oreal campaign compared to being on the arm of a prince? You know, and quite frankly, Gina had never managed to secure her anything that exciting. So she just uses Gina at, like right now, Gina is still in her life because she wants somebody that she can giggle with about who she's seeing. Because she can't talk to anybody else about it right now. But as soon as she can, I mean, she can't wait to kick Gina to the curb. You know, all the money she's paying Gina. And remember that Gina and Nelthorpe Cowan had really liked Megan. They'd gone on trips together. She really thought Megan was a nice girl. She was completely under Megan's spell. She could not differentiate between real Megan and fake Megan. And quite frankly, Megan had not shown her yet the ugly side. Remember her agent in America, Lori Sales, the one who's really seen Megan's side. Lori Sales was the one who had to come to Megan and be like, pull it together, you're an embarrassment. And so to Gina, she had never yet shown that side because Gina still might have connections. Remember every time she saw Gina, she was asking, don't you know any British men who are single? So Gina thinks that Megan is just this really fun, girly girl, you know, just really on her game. You know, all the best things you can think about Megan, Gina is still under that spell. Well, that little dream is about to come crashing down around poor Gina's head. Uh, all right, so Megan has managed to make this date. Now, Harry, not surprisingly, had never heard of Meghan Markle. But he trusted the judgment of his childhood friend, Violet, and he was excited to go out. A close friend would later say that one question Harry asked very carefully of Von Westenholtz was about Megan's appearance. Exactly what did he mean about Megan's background? Her biography on Google was enticing. 
so he wanted to get all the details he wanted to find out you know does she really look this pretty in real life and all this well apparently whatever violet knew and violet couldn't have known much it's not like she and megan had known each other that long whatever she knew she passed along to harry and it it appeased him he was happy to hear it and they decided that on the first of july 2016 uh they would meet now nearly 35 Megan had mentioned to Gina that her biological clock was ticking and it was time to have kids if she was ever going to get it done. And Gina knew that it wasn't just kids that Megan was excited about. I mean, she could have kids at any point in her life if she was really that gung-ho to have them. Gina realized that Megan had set her sights on the very best prize that she could ever attain as far as gaining global celebrity. Now, as we've already said in the last episode, Harry personally was no prize, but his status certainly was. Because even if she just brushed up against him for a minute, if people knew that he had associated with her, suddenly she would be somebody. It wouldn't matter if they broke up. I mean, of course, she wasn't going to let that happen, hardly. <laughs> but even if the worst were to happen and things were to end abruptly, really, what was that? That, that was, you know, no skin off her back because she would now be famous. The very thing she'd always wanted all her life. She told Gina that she knew exactly how during their conversation that she would assure him that she was the one. And Harry said later, she was the one. The very first time we met, I knew it. She was the one. Don't you wish that you had the powers of persuasion that Megan seems to hold? But I just truly think that her prey was so gullible. He couldn't have seen it. If she had lit a stick of dynamite under his nose, he would have said, what happens next? I mean, he just seemed to have no ability to see around corners. All right, well, they go on the date. She rushes to Gina, because again, Gina's the only one who knows. Gina's the only one she can tell about it. And she said, he's lovely, adorable, and a true English gentleman. Well, he must have been wearing some kind of a mask himself. And Gina said, are you going to meet again? And she said, we hope so. I know we will because we left on great terms. Now, when you think back to Spare, she kind of rushed out on that first date. And it would appear to all of us who are reading it that, I mean, we could see what she was doing. We knew what was happening here, you know, give him just enough to make him want to come back for more. So, of course, they were going to meet again. Gina says that she and Megan just giggled over the news. I mean, they could not believe Megan's luck. And she said that they were both in heaven like teenagers about the news. I mean, this was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to them. Megan let Gina know as soon as they had made a second date. And she just couldn't get over it. I mean, she was just flabbergasted at her luck. And she just said that Harry was the loveliest man she had ever met. Apparently, they, they met again at some point. On the 3rd of July, Megan posted on Instagram a picture of two love heart candies like you know those I think the um you know the Valentine's Day candies those chalky horrible things that say things like kiss me and I love you and be mine anyway she posted a picture of that um uh, with kiss me and love hearts in London underneath it she just met this guy you guys let me recall to you her age 35 35 this would be galling behavior from a 15 year old. Like I'd be like, girl, pull it together. Are you for real right now? You just met this guy and you're posting on your social media, candy hearts, kiss me, love hearts in London. I can't. Okay, so anyway, she doesn't care. She wants everybody to know that, you know, she's up to something in London. Can't say it, can't say what it is, but it is so good. So um, on the morning of July 4th, dressed in Ralph Lauren, she went to Wimbledon. She, of course, made sure to thank Violet for all Violet had done. After watching the match, she drove directly to Heathrow to fly back to Toronto for the filming of Suits. And, of course, she's got to run over to, you know, social media and let everybody know what she's doing. Gutted to be leaving London. Okay, first of all, Americans don't say gutted. That is such a British thing to say. I hate this whole, like, there's just nothing worse than when an American goes to, to England they, they, they take like a hot second in London and they come back saying things like, I'm gutted to be doing, you know, because of such and such. Americans don't say that. And I don't care they don't. You know, that's just, uh, just stop, Megan. Just 
just stop it. Okay, well, also, this doesn't jive with what we heard from Spare. Do we not recall how he brought her the box of cupcakes? And then she was, she just shook them like a maniac and he had to be like, please don't shake those, they're cupcakes. Sit. What's this? Do we recall this? Well, uh, that apparently never happened because she went straight from the match to fly away back to Canada to go film Sue. So I don't know what Harry's talking about. Two weeks later, Harry secretly flew to Toronto. Again, another lie in Spare. In Spare, he acts like he could never manage to get across the pond because it's just so hard for him to arrange, you know, to transatlantic travel. It's so difficult for him because he's so important and so famous and there's just so much protection that has to go into any time he travels. But according to this book, he couldn't get off the plane. All right, so there he is flying to Toronto. He couldn't go to Megan's house. And now why would that be? Uh, could it be one, one chef named Corey? Yeah, they're still together. They're still together. Megan has not ended it. And of course she wouldn't end that meal ticket. She hasn't secured her second one. You know, she might still need Corey. So she's like, you can't stay with me. And she would have had some coy little innocent, you know, virginal statement about, you can't stay with me. I don't do that kind of thing. Uh, she does. She definitely does. But uh, unfortunately, Corey's also in the bed, so it might get a little crowded. Um, so he stayed presumably with Jessica Mulrooney. Um, the situation was quite tricky, but Megan never had problems managing a tricky situation before. So she's fine with it. Um, because Megan had so carefully researched Harry's life, she knew exactly what he needed and who she needed to be to draw him very successfully into her web. She knew exactly what kind of mothering he would want from her. She knew exactly what kind of gentleness she needed to use with him, what kind of firmness she also needed to use with him. She understood that she needed to tell him what to do next. She understood that she needed to bear his burdens. She had to be his problem solver. And she had to make sure that he began to rely on her very quickly to be in a more, an emotional support system that he would think he could not do without. Because she had researched his past girlfriends, she knew that he had a sense of paranoia about who he led into his life. He always thought that somebody was going to try to come in and... Um, undermine him or get a story on him and all this. And because she realized that, she knew that she needed to negate those fears early on. So she knew all the right things to say. And she knew that it was also incredibly important to encourage him and make him think that she thought he was brilliant to continually, continually, continually congratulate him on his ambition and on his intelligence and on his care and concern for the environment and for his charities and build him up. The thing is, is that that works with any man. I mean, it works with any human. Who doesn't want to be told that they are, who, who doesn't want to hear about their virtues? You know, who doesn't want to be encouraged? But I think that men are particularly susceptible to a woman who understands that if she says things about how much she respects him, I mean, it's like, he's like putty in her hands. And there's so many women who use that against men, that little tidbit of knowledge. You know, I'll just continually build him up. And there are just some men who cannot withstand a compliment. Well, she found the one who is the most susceptible to compliments. And so there she is, just working him, playing him like a fiddle is what she's doing. Megan says, I think that very early on, when we realized we were going to commit to each other, we knew we had to invest the time and energy and whatever it took to make that happen. Now, she knew what, what she means by that. Of course, that sounds lovely. We were going to invest in each other. No, she's going to make sure that he cannot exist without her. She's going to make him very clingy and she's going to make him feel like she's the answer to all of his problems. Well, naturally, she could not keep the relationship secret. I mean, of all the people that she has found herself with, this is by far a cut above the rest, the rest of her relationships. I mean, this she has just been shot into the stratosphere. And Harry 
had told her to please be quiet about the relationship. You know, he wants to be very quiet. In Spare, he goes on and on and on about how every relationship that he'd ever had that he was excited about got ruined as soon as the media found out about it. Now, that seems to me to be his explanation for why the women in his life finally realized, you know what, you're kind of a loser and I could do better. But according to him, it was always the paparazzi. So he tells Megan, please don't tell anybody. But of course she doesn't. She doesn't heed his warnings. She goes ahead and she tells her closest Toronto friends. And then, of course, her dad. Over a series of conversations, a um, couple of days in succession, she would reveal a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Until on the third day, she finally just said, it's a prince. I'm, I'm dating an English prince. And there's only one of them that was eligible. Now, once she realized that she and Harry were a sure thing, she went ahead and gave Corey the boot. She told him that it was over. And, you know, he had no idea what was really happening. He had no idea who she was really having over to the house when he wasn't there. Uh, but he was glad that it was finally over because, quite frankly, the final months had been unpleasant. So he packed his belongings and about mid-July, so very, I mean, she just met Harry July 1st, right? So mid-July, she's given Corey the boot. Okay, goodbye. You know, we've been talking about how it should be over. I'm letting you know now it's done. He goes and moves in with his friend Richard Lambert who had a bunch of bars and nightclubs. Now that the house is hers, she can have Harry over whenever. Tom Bauer says that coincidentally, during these particular weeks, it just so happened that she was asked questions about Britain on a TV quiz show. I stumbled upon this years ago. And I didn't know at what time she'd been asked these questions. But that didn't even matter to me because what struck me was how catty she is in this particular interview and I'll see if I can find it and post it you know I'll see if I can find it and I'll I'll put it in this video because she is super rude and when the when the presenter is asking her some questions it's just a quiz show you you know this isn't like your admissions into Harvard if you don't know the answers she took it really personally that she couldn't answer any of the questions she wouldn't have looked dumb if she hadn't known but she looked stupid because her response was so rude on the quiz show, they asked her if she knew the Cockney rhyming slang, apples and pears. Stairs. Obviously, she didn't watch To Serve With Love. If you did, you would know. But anyway, she didn't know that. All right, that's fine. I, we can give her a pass on that. She also had no idea who the three national animals of Britain's kingdoms were. The lion, the, uni the, lion, the unicorn, and the dragon. And she was super dismissive. Here's the thing. Okay, maybe you don't know about the unicorn. Maybe you don't know about the dragon. But you don't know about the lion? Really? The... She's so ignorant. I... I, I I'm sorry. She is. The things that she doesn't know shock me. They do. Because I'm not saying you have to know all the things there are to know in life. But you should know a few vague and general things about other countries you don't know about the british lion have you never seen a standard have you, I mean, do you how, what is going on here you know like how do you not know that well she didn't know and she says on the clip of this show am i supposed to know that well maybe not now but hopefully you can figure out what you know a little bit more about these people that you're trying to join yourself in union with what is the national animal of England? Am I supposed to know that? What is the national animal of Scotland? Give me these questions. What is the national animal of Scotland? I don't know. That's not even a Jeopardy question. What is the national animal of Wales? <clears throat> I can't say that I know. Are these real right now? It's you know, the first four weeks that she met Harry, complete and total whirlwind for her. Now, we recall from Spare that Harry had told her on that last date in England, the one that he says happened on July 4th. I don't really know when it happened, but the last time they'd seen each other in London, he said that he had wanted to spend the summer with her um, and that they needed to see each other again. And she said she couldn't because she was going on this whole eat, pray, love tour. Now we've already seen that that was a colossal lie because in these months, he's flying all over the place, you know, back and forth from Toronto. So his, his recollection and spare that they hadn't seen each other you know, they went to Soho House and ate a couple of cupcakes together. And then the next time they saw each other, they were rolling around in Botswana. Uh, no, no, they were going back and forth and seeing each other co constantly and continually. So lie, 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 lie and spare. Like we already knew that, but still it's annoying. And then two, in spare, she makes this big proclamation that she can't see him, that she's just 
completely booked. Her, you know, her social calendar is just slam packed because she's going on this whole eat, pray, love tour. But she'll try to leave some room for magic. And wouldn't you know it, she's available the same week he is for Botswana. All right, well, in this book, it would appear that she wasn't exactly going on any eat, pray, love tour. <clears throat> she did have some things she was doing that summer. She had to go to New York for Lindsay Roth's wedding. Um, she also went to Italy with Jessica Mulroney. And then she went to Rwanda for World Vision. Those are the things she had to do. But then she circled right back around and went to London. Because she could go see Harry again. Um, of course, she has to meet Gina and Nelpa Raccoon. Because then she can speak freely and openly about what's going on with her and Harry. And she tells Gina, things are going really well. They just couldn't be better. He's asked me to go to Botswana. And I'm... I'm going. Well, Gina was incredulous. I understood straight away, she recalled, that Megan would mesmerize that broken-hearted young boy that we saw following his mother's coffin. I was almost as excited as she was about her conquest. Anyone taken to Botswana in those circumstances would fall in love. But Nelthorpe Cowan did see problems ahead. She says, now y'all, this is where the mask slips and completely falls off Megan's face. Have you any idea what you're doing? Gina asked. Harry, she explained, was clearly thinking about marriage. Do you realize you won't be able to make any more movies? Royal duties will be your life. Okay, so she did have a friend who told her, all right? So had she not come to the conclusion on her own, Gina's over there repeatedly saying, hey, remember, your life's going to be different. Gina, bless her heart, thought that Megan really wanted to be an actress. No, no. The fact that she thinks it's going to be like, a pump the brakes moment for Megan when Megan finds out she can't make movies anymore. Megan hadn't been making movies anyway. This is where Megan shows her ugly side. Gina, save it. Megan snapped. Nelthorpe Cowan was taken aback by the steel in Megan's voice. Holding up her hand, Megan continued, stop, be quiet. I don't want to hear any negativity. This is a happy time for us. So you just save everything you have, Gina. Excuse me? Gina has been your faithful friend low these many years. And this is how you're going to repay her kindness? Snapping at her when all she said was, hey, it's going to be really different being attached to a prince. She's trying to help you, Megan. Gina had never seen Megan like this. And she was struck by the fury in Megan's eyes. Though at the time, she really did fail to grasp the significance of Megan's anger and the significance of like why Megan was so desperate to shut any negativity down. Because the thing is, is that Harry was in her web. She was not even about to play around in her mind with the what if of if something happened. Um, she was going on that trip to Africa and she was going to snag this prince and, you know, come hell or high water, he was hers. Now, years later, Megan tried to act like she really contemplated if she should really go to Africa she really wondered if that was something she should do so early on in the relationship. Oh, please. She said that she had told people, you know, is it crazy to go away like this? And of course, her spokesman, Obed Scobie, was all like, you know, it wasn't something she'd ever done before. Yeah, right. Wasn't something she'd ever done before, please. She had never been invited on a trip she didn't go on. The thing is, uh, Tom Bauer says that betrayal of coy uncertainty was barely convincing. She knew that any association with Harry, even if it ended abruptly, would establish her as a super celebrity. Yeah, right she wasn't going to go on some trip to Africa with Harry, with Prince Harry. This, this girl has been trying to climb the greasy pole of life since she could barely walk. Of course she's going to go with a prince to Africa. Quite frankly, who, who among us would not go with Prince Harry to Africa, even if you weren't interested in him. That's gonna be the trip of a lifetime. Who wouldn't go? Well, they went. Um, of course, living secretly in a tented camp overlooking a river in lush hills, their five days were filled with watching wild animals, swimming and eating, and who's not gonna fall in love under those circumstances? Megan was the fourth girl he brought to Botswana, so this was kind of like the card he always played. And like them, Megan was the type to whom Harry could confess his secrets. So, you know, 
Megan, I I believe that the other girls were so much more sincere than Megan ever ever was. Those girls weren't were fine being Harry's girlfriend for a little while, but once they realized who he really was, they weren't willing to tack their life to his just because he's famous. They they wanted more for themselves. But not Megan. She loved the fact that he needed her emotionally. And Tom Bauer writes that Harry could fall in love with her because she could save him from what he feared about himself. It was absolutely amazing to get to know her as quickly as I did, Harry later said. He, he goes on to say that the days were crucial to me to make sure we really got to know each other. <laughs> I mean, he's so dim-witted. She is a, an absolute con artist. And of course she was going to make him feel like it was this wonderful you know, meeting of t the mingling of two souls, you know, he could not have seen his way out of that. You know, had he had several guides dragging him by the hands, he wanted to be taken in. He had to have been. Anyway, by the time they returned to London, they had agreed that in future, while keeping their relationship a secret, they should not be apart for more than two weeks. She could not stand the idea of him ever coming to the conclusion that he did not need her. Um, you know, when she was talking to Jean and Elthorpe Crown, she had said as much. Megan explained that she needed to prevent Harry from escaping. She was not going to let him get away. So this whole thing about we need to see each other every two weeks. We need each other and our love is so delicate and such a beautiful thing that we cannot be apart for more than two weeks. I cannot be apart from you for more than two weeks. You know, and she makes it seem like she's doing him some big favor to do this. And of course, in Spare, he writes about it as though it was a big favor. He writes about the fact that she was always coming to see him because of course he couldn't make that transatlantic journey. It was just too much of a security risk. So she always had to come. And it's disgusting because Megan is not doing him any favors. She's trying to snare him. She's trying to secure the deal. She cannot allow him out of her sight for too long. What if a different girl comes along? What if he finds out something about her? She has to always be with him so she can manage the narration about her life to him. He can't learn a different narrative. He can't learn anything else about her. She has to make sure that he is under her control at all times. She continues to have her lunches with Gina. Gina continues to remind her that life is going to be different as things get more serious with Harry. Gina says, this is serious. This is the end of your normal life. This is the end of your privacy, everything. Are you okay with this? And Megan smiled. Oh yeah, I'm fine with it. Fine with it. It's all she could ever dream of. So Nelthorpe Crown says, I knew then that they were certain to get married. And she told Megan, look, I'm, I'm happy for you. But when you finally become at the top of society, please use your platform. Do me a favor. Use your platform to save the environment. And of course, Megan's like, yes, I will. Megan could care less about the environment. And in that moment, as Megan sees her journey moving ahead and Gina Nelthorpe Town staying right here, she doesn't have any use for Gina. Gina can't take her anymore, anywhere anymore. She's played out. She didn't need Gina. And she, uh, Tom Bauer writes, their intimacy suddenly evaporated. Megan, Nelthorpe Cowan feared, was no longer a genuine friend. Focused on what she wanted, she wasn't going to listen to anything that cast a shadow. Even though Gina is not being negative as she discusses what the future will be with Harry. She's not saying, oh, he's, you know, full of problems. He's, you know, emotionally mature. He's, he, he has no goals, dreams, or ambitions. He doesn't have much of a personality. Nothing like that. She's just saying life's going to get, you know, so different for you. And, and in an excited way, not, not in a derogatory way, not trying to talk her out of it. But Megan is just, I don't even, I don't think she left Gina because Gina wanted to talk about the future for Megan. I think Megan just didn't need her anymore. Gina had been useful for her as long as Gina could potentially, possibly, maybe get her a deal with L'Oreal or any of these other big brands. But now that she is being linked with Harry, what does she need L'Oreal for? Megan has no use for Gina. Anyway, naturally, Megan did not reveal all her feelings to Nelthorpe Cowan. As she would say one year later about marrying into the royal family, I do not see it as giving anything up. I see it as a change. It's a new chapter. And... 
we've all seen those videos, you know, where Harry is talking, I think it was at their engagement interview where Harry's talking about duty and self-denial. And you can see on her face, she looks very strained because that's not what she's excited about, you know? And I also think that it's really, I mean, she told us in that interview when she said, I don't see it as giving anything up. Well, yeah, because she didn't intend to give anything up. For her, what difference was it going to make? This is what I truly believe about Megan. She, it wasn't that she was ill-informed about the changes that were coming her way. It's that she did not anticipate accepting the change. That she says, I don't see this giving anything up. She, she told us right then and there how she was going to behave. I don't have to do what the royal family says. I'm not British. I can come in and do anything I want. This is your culture. I do not ascribe to your culture. So this might have been the rules for everyone else. It won't be the rules for me. She just thought she could come in and bulldoze. And because she's an American and because it's not her culture, that it would be her right to behave in that arena however she saw fit. That she could stumble through it and make an ass of herself the whole time and everyone was just going to laugh it off and think she was so cute because she didn't know and she would just play the doe-eyed innocent like, oops, was I supposed to know that? Oh, was I not supposed to take selfies with the crowd? Oh, am I not supposed to hug everybody's neck all the time? I mean, she was just going to act like just this floozy who just, oops, the whole time. Well, oops is not going to get you into the hearts and minds of the people. So anyway, um... She didn't want to hear that life was going to be different because for her, it, she didn't intend for it to be. She thought that marrying a prince was going to set her into the jet setting class of the world. She did not believe for even one tiny second that being part of Harry's life would mean that her life was going to change. It meant that his life was going to change for the better because he was with her and together they would go change the world. She told you to Nelthorpe Calm this. Harry and I together, we're going to change the world. For what? What grand ideas had she ever had? And certainly he was, he was no font of wisdom. What, what plan did she think their two feeble minds were going to hatch to save the world? Um, now, Megan had been, one of the last things that an Althorpe Crown had arranged for Megan was to speak at the One Young World Summit in Ottawa. Billed as among the brightest young leaders from around the world, Megan was listed, against all logic, as a UN women advocate for leadership and political participation and as a global ambassador for World Vision. She is a global ambassador for World Vision. She has not been any part of the UN women for ages now. And the fact that the UN women didn't ever stop, step in and be like, hey, hey, wait a second, wait a second, whoa, 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 wait, you don't work for us is astounding to me, except for the fact that they probably never kept tabs with what she was doing because she was a nobody. What did they really care? So she could say whatever she wanted and, and there never was there was no comeuppance. Nobody ever said, wait, 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 wait. No, you're not. Mm -mm. Hang on. We let you go a while ago. So she's still clinging on about, I'm a UN woman. Now she said, Megan was supposed to give a speech and she told her agent, I have one demand and it's that when I get there, I want to make sure that my picture is taken with Justin Trudeau and Kofi Annan. Um, it's very important, very important, and it must be done. Okay, so that was, Gina had that clanging around in her head that needed to get done. Um, also to satisfy her demands, Nelthorpe Crown had arranged for Megan to be featured in a special edition of Vanity Fair as an exceptional young leader. Megan was seated on a minibus with all the chosen leaders who were, they were all going to the photo shoot, the Vanity Fair photo shoot together. And seeing Megan through an open door, there was a young female reporter who asked Megan a very benign question. It wasn't intrusive or anything. We don't have the question listed, but apparently it was not offensive. It was just a very benign question. And Megan snaps at the reporter, talk to my agent, okay? Leave me alone. And she turns to Gina and says, Gina, just sort this out. Why couldn't she just answer the reporter? Why did it have to be this big, dramatic, talk to my agent, don't you dare talk to me, moment. I mean, really, seriously? Why would you ever treat people like this? Nelthorpe Cowan was taken aback and a little shocked. Until that moment, in her eyes, Megan had always been warm and accommodating to everyone. Megan had changed. She was only a feminist when it suited her according to Nelthorpe Cowan. 
Back in the hotel, Meghan had a new demand. Once her relationship with Harry was known and she had spent more time in London, she explained that she would need a special media relations team. I want you to handle it, Gina, said Meghan. Now, I don't have any money, so I can't pay you. Um, but kudos is going to be immeasurable and everybody's going to know your name because you're going to be associated with me. So I don't really, I wouldn't think you'd want any money anyway. Um, so you'll work for me without payment. And of course, Gina refused this. This is not an offer that anybody with any business savvy would take. What are you talking about? Kudos will be my payment to you? Are you kidding me right now? Who does Megan think she is? Would she ever accept a job with no pay attached to it because of the kudos? Well, Megan might have was with the most with, with an important enough person, but Gina needs to pay the bills, okay? She doesn't she's not hanging off the arm of a prince right now. So Gina politely declines the offer. Um, she was not a PR agency and she lacked the staff and expertise, but she promised Megan that once Harry was connected and, and, and everyone knew that, that Megan's commercial appeal, especially in America would increase and Megan wouldn't have any trouble finding a PR team that would work with her. Megan was insulted by Nelthorpe Cowan's rejection of her proposal and felt that it was a personal slight to her. Girl, you just asked this woman to lay down her life for you for no pay. How is she supposed to pay her bills? Kudos does not keep the water running and the electricity on. Uh, now, the evening that Megan is supposed to give this talk, she's photographed with Justin Trudeau, but unexpectedly, Kofi Annan had left Ottawa the same day and missed the dinner. So her picture that she had wanted with Kofi Annan evaporated right before her very eyes. And the chance for the photograph was lost. Nelthorpe Cowan watched her client fume the following morning, Megan announced that she would not make her speech. She was returning immediately to Toronto. Suits was calling and they had to get to filming immediately. And she just did not have time for this. Okay. Well, uh, you made a deal to make a speech. And Gina says, you've already agreed to that. You can't just leave now. They're expecting you. You're, that's your time slot. The, the schedule's already made. You can't. It's today you're supposed to give that speech. You can't just leave. And Megan's like, I am leaving and you can sort it because you're my agent. So you'll tell people what needs to be told. I'm done, I'm out, I'm going. Meanwhile, while Megan is chewing up Gina, somebody comes up and interrupts their conversation. And then Megan rounds on that person and, and, and proclaims, don't these people have manners? She didn't even greet me when she came up and interrupted us. How dare her? Well, Megan, she probably doesn't know who you are, okay? You might be dating the prince, but no one knows that yet. Well, embarrassed, Gina Nelthorpe Cowan rushed back to her room and for the first time in her long career, burst into tears. Since Megan and Harry had become an item, she realized her client had become a different woman. There was a big change after that, says Gina. The change was partly influenced by Harry's obsession with the importance of protection, bodyguards, and privileged status. So whenever Harry was going to Toronto, he always flew first class, obviously, with a baseball cap, scuttle off the plane, get into a vehicle on the tarmac, rush off to wherever Megan was. Whenever he was in Canada, he had bodyguards. They sat outside her house in an SUV. They took him wherever he needed to go. He was never without multiple people to protect him, which gave her already inflated ego more reassurance that she could behave however she wanted because if he was that important, she was that important. Those privileges influenced her reaction to an encounter in the first class airport lounge on a return trip. An airline official asked her to move to another seat to make way for a group of male Colombian dignitaries. Without protest, she picked up her bag, but in the future, she pledged, no one would ask her to move. Okay, well, is she Rosa Parks? I mean, Megan did not need anybody to give her a another ego boost. Megan does not need people to tell her how important she is. She already thinks that. So now with Harry and his obsession about protection, now she gets to join in that and also be obsessed with it. You know, she's already been living in this false reality that everybody wants her, uh, the paparazzi can't can't wait to get a hold of her. 
she's already trying to put herself under aliases when she stays at hotels. She thinks that the world cares who she is. Now that she's with somebody who the world really does care about and who does have, you know, make media attention when he goes places, oh my goodness, her little heart is going pitter patter. She can't wait to be scared about her need for security. She can't wait to be petrified by paparazzi. She can't wait to be scandalized when she reads her name in the tabloids. So the fact that these two people met each other, what a, what a boiling pot of hot garbage juice their relationship is. And I just cannot wait to get into the next chapters. It's going to be so good. And the next episode is going to be so much longer. So I'm sorry that this week the episodes have all been off. Um, we listed our house last weekend and sold our house last weekend. So that was a super busy time for us. So anyway, as our move is happening and as school is ending, um, the episodes, I cannot promise you what days they will come, but I'm still aiming for three a week. So thank you so much for your patience. And I will see you guys later. Bye.